coming. The Fiber Department and the Center for Craft and Applied Arts in Detroit are pleased to welcome Emily Zilber to Michigan and back to Cranbrook. From 2007 to 2010, Emily was assistant curator at Cranbrook Art Museum, so she's familiar to a few of you. Currently, she serves as the Ronald C. and Anita L. Warnick Curator of Contemporary Decorative Arts at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, a position she has held since 2010. Emily has edited and written for numerous publications, speaks regularly on topics related to 20th and 21st century decorative arts, craft, and design, and is a founding member of the Boston-based consortium, The Commonwealth of Craft. Most recently, she curated Crafted Objects in Flux at the MFA. Emily holds a BA in Art History from the University of Chicago and an MA from Bard Graduate Center for Decorative Arts, Design, History, and Material Culture. This evening, she will speak about the role of craft in contemporary art practice and the strategies that encyclopedic museums, such as the MFA Boston, have employed to present relevant contemporary work while reinterpreting their historic collections. Please welcome Emily Zilbert. So thank you. It's really wonderful to be back at Cranbrook. I've had a fantastic two days with the students in Fiber. So thank you for making me feel welcome and as though I never left. Um, it, I have to say that all of the work at the MFA that I'm going to be talking about in this presentation really rests on a foundation that was cultivated here at Cranbrook working with the Art Museum. Um, and so it's lovely to, to be back in this capacity. Um, so today I'd like to look at the relationship between craft, the contemporary, the encyclopedic museum, and particularly how we navigate these categories at the MFA Boston. And for those of you who have not had a chance to visit, I'm showing you an overview of our facility here, um, close to the Fenway in Boston, so you can really see the sort of monolithic behemoth type of institution that I'm talking about, just from the sheer architectural scale. Um, the MFA is one of the nation's largest art institutions and includes a collection of over 500,000 objects spanning the history of human making across cultures. And so contemporary is just a very small fraction of this story. So with this setting in mind, you know, how and where might contemporary craft live in the museum? How do we make decisions around the display of this work? How does the collection grow? And perhaps what, uh, most importantly, what can the museum through the objects that it collects and exhibits um, do to engage the work of contemporary artists in a way that helps deepen and expand public understanding of craft both as it exists today and in historical context. So I'll look at these ideas broadly through the work that the museum has been doing um, during a time of tremendous change in the past five years or so. Um, before we enter into a conversation of the present, I'm gonna share a brief anecdote about the museum's past collecting and exhibiting of contemporary craft, um, which has happened actively since its first years virtually in concert with its opening in July of 1876. And so it's worth remembering, um, as it notes in this piece by the Italian artist Maurizio Nanucci that hangs in our contemporary wing at the museum, all art has been contemporary. Um, so when we think about the contemporary, there's maybe broader and different ways to frame things in the context of a historical site. This Tiffany picture is actually the first work of contemporary craft that entered the museum's collection. Given to the MFA in 1877, this then contemporary work was made for and purchased from the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. It melds art, industry, and education. Those are the three key components of the museum's founding mission. This picture is a signifier of this kind of robust interest in contemporary craft objects at the MFA during its early years. And I'll note that the MFA wasn't just looking sort of broadly for these objects, but it collected very close to home and was a big proponent, propo uh, proponent of supporting uh, local and, and regional contemporary artists in historically considered craft disciplines and forms. And so I'm showing two examples of that work here, ceramics um, from the Paul Revere pottery of the Saturday Evening Girls Club, and a beautiful box by Elizabeth Ethel Copeland. 
Um, they really engage deeply with the center of, uh, with Boston as a center, both intellectual and practical of the American arts and crafts movement. So contemporary museum, engaging contemporary artists in a very particular kind of way. Beautiful and skilled contemporary work using craft materials and forms. Uh, uh, here, when I say this, I'm speaking specifically about objects produced in fiber, wood, furniture, jewelry, ceramics, glass, and metals, both functional and non-functional, um, have been displayed in various ways over subsequent years. In the 1970s, the museum first began to collect studio craft as a part of its American Decorative Arts and Sculpture Department. And it's worth noting that that department was the first such department, the first decorative arts uh, American Decorative Arts Department of any encyclopedic museum in the United States. The first one to say, look, the material culture of our own country is really worth engaging with deeply. Um, they created the uh, Please Be Seated program in the late 1970s, which was funded by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, a program that engaged museum visitors by making then contemporary furniture accessible for use in the gallery and provided the museum with a core collection of studio furniture from the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. So both of these works um, have been out and available for gallery seating in the museum space by Judy McKee, fantastic um, Cambridge-based furniture maker and certainly um, you know, the founder or sort of uh, father of, a, of the studio craft, uh, studio furniture movement, Wendell Castle, this fantastic settee, both made for visitor seating real ways that um, our visitors can engage with the kind of tactile craft object. And this is what craft looked like at the museum in the 1970s. Um, I'm showing here an exhibition, uh, an image from the exhibition Furniture and Craft from 1978, which was the only way other than as gallery seating one might encounter craft in the museum. Here we're looking at a small media specific space that didn't interface with a larger contemporary art context. So in between the sort of late 1970s when a lot of this activity got started and 2010 when I came to the museum, our international collection grew primarily through important gifts and um, exhibitions. And I'm just gonna mention two because I hope they will serve as resources for students here at the MF, at Cranbrook who might be interested in this material. Um, one was a tremendous gift of work by Ed Rossback. We actually have about 150 pieces by Rossback in the collection, including this signature Mickey Mouse lace, something that he is said to have produced in response to students at Berkeley calling his uh, weaving classes Mickey Mouse classes. So we've got this tremendous sense of wit, and I'm showing an installation of the show we had there in 2004. And then, um, of course, the Daphne Farrago collection of contemporary studio jewelry. And here on the left is a really wonderful book. I recommend this as a resource for anyone who's thinking about jewelry or adornment in the kind of contemporary sphere. This is a collection of 650 uh, works by jewelry artists dating from the 1940s to around 2006, um, international. So it really gives us a foundation for making studio jewelry a huge component of our collection. So before my role was established in 2010, contemporary decorative arts, craft, and design were continually collected at the museum, but done so by individual departments across an institution, depending on a curator's interest in the material. Without an overarching mandate, however, what's resulted is sort of a rich but uneven collection. There are great things to build on, but there are also lots of holes. My job is to focus on international craft and design produced from the 1960s forward, both filling in historical gaps and keeping our collection conversant with the contemporary landscape as best as a sort of behemoth institution can. We move a little more slowly than, say, a Kunsthal exclusively focused on the contemporary. Um, what's really unusual, and I think what will be of interest to you as artists working in the contemporary sphere, is that I sit within the MFA's contemporary art department rather than a decorative arts department. Here as the lone champion for decorative arts, craft, and design, my job is to integrate objects 
that speak to these fields historically and an attention of, to making into the museum's larger contemporary program. So by structuring the position in this way, the MFA is the only encyclopedic museum in the country that does this and makes a point of saying that craft is institutionally sanctioned as a vital aspect of the broader contemporary art world. Really an exciting thing to see a big institution like this say. So the past five years have been a time of tremendous change and they've provided us with an impetus to really broadly rethink the context or contexts for this material in the museum's program. I'm showing images here from our 53 gallery New American Wing opened in 2010. So 53 galleries, really the size of a mid to, you know, kind of large size museum that's been appended onto the institution designed by Norman uh, Foster and partners and dedicated to displaying the art of North, South, and Central America. I bring this up here because it's a precedent for showing spaces that integrate media of all types in all galleries. And there's a wonderful, lovely Cranbrook moment in um, the image of our 20s and 30s gallery at the lower right where I hope you can see a Maya Grotel vessel on the Donald Desky bookcase uh, there. So I'll, I actually have tried to put this presentation together to bring in as many Cranbrook artist references as I can. I'm sort of in the tank for you guys, so <laughs> hopefully you'll appreciate that. We don't just show Cranbrook artists at the MFA, <laughs> for better or for worse. Um, I was also part of the team that opened um, a new renovation of our 1981 IMPE edition, which is now the Lindy Family Wing for Contemporary Art that opened in September of 2011. Um, and I'm showing some of the public spaces of that wing here, not the gallery spaces. This is the museum's first permanent display space for its contemporary collection and features over 20,000 square feet of galleries focused on international contemporary practice across media. So we really try to take advantage through spaces like this on what putting work in different kinds of contexts can offer to our audience, uh, our different audiences. You know, and with an encyclopedic museum, our audiences are everyone, right? <laughs> it's a very big, broad goal. Um, and we also think about how those contextual shifts can better reflect the reality of artists' lives and artistic production. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of how those juxtapositions work in our galleries. Um, I'm showing here a thematically organized gallery that looks at, in the 20th and 21st centuries, how um, the stuff of art itself, so line, color, and shape, and form, and the stuff of everyday life, both become fodder for art making in different ways. Um, it allows us to talk about sort of things that are minimal and formal and also things that deal with pop in different kinds of ways. You can see in the overall gallery shot that we have um, a Warhol paper dress with a Nevelson with an Ellsworth Kelly with a Tony Smith. Um, unfortunately, because they're small, they're hard to show in the photograph, but just outside the frame, we also have an installation of works by Ken Price and by the Italian jeweler Giampaolo Babetto. Babetto is deliberately compared with and contrasted to our Tony Smith. Um, both of these artists are thinking about and referencing Vitruvius and Palladian architecture and how they're thinking about proportion. With Ken Price and Ellsworth Kelly, we're looking at notions of flat panes and planes of color, how they relate to one another. And so allowing these works to be in dialogue and sort of a thematic dialogue doesn't speak to a sort of teleological art historical narrative, but it allows a sort of opening of context, opening of vision. Um, we do the same thing in the American wing, and I'm just showing here, sometimes those comparisons are a little more historically grounded. We show our great Peter Volkus Camelback Mountain from 1959 with Franz Klein's Probst One from just a year later, around the same time that both of these artists were hanging out together in New York, sharing ideas, and certainly having relationships that impacted their work regardless of what material it's being manufactured in. In a gallery that we have that focuses on notions of repetition and pattern in art making, we juxtapose um, our fantastic Josiah McElhaney endlessly repeating 20th century modernism against this work by Sheila Hicks that I'm really proud to have brought into our collection from the late 1960s. Um, and I 
bring up this particular comparison to note that sort of artists from across a wide variety of communities engage with techniques, forms, and materials appropriated from or engaged with the decorative arts. Um, and I really view them as fair targets for having conversations about craft in our galleries, whether they self-identify as part of a craft community or not. Um, Josiah McElhaney, for example, trained as a glass blower at the Rhode Island School of Design and then apprenticed for two years with Swedish glassmakers and for five years with the glassmaster Lino Talia Pietra, something that is not necessarily emphasized but is key to the conceptual practice here, his ability to blow these perfect vessels. Um, we collect artists who see themselves as firm members of these communities and also so-called crossover practitioners, paying special attention to sort of blurred boundaries between disciplines like art, craft, and design, and fashion that are an accepted feature of contemporary making. You as artists engage with these blurring boundaries all the time, but these can often challenge uh, the once necessary and rigid systems for classification that govern large institutions like ours. So for example, the artist Martin Perrier comes from a background of skilled making. Perrier works really wonderfully with wood, having completed both a Yale sculpture MFA and an apprenticeship with a Scandinavian cabinet maker. I think equally significant parts of his background and how he engages with form and with material. When this deep engagement with materiality is emphasized alongside a larger aesthetic and conceptual issue uh, at play in an artist's work like Perrier's, the dialogue becomes richer. And so there is some understanding that I might speak about this work very differently than my colleague who comes from a more, uh, a less sort of materials focused contemporary art background. In addition to the broader thematic spaces of the Lindy Family Wing, I oversee the Daphne and Peter Farrago Gallery. This is a space dedicated exclusively to contemporary works in traditional craft media and forms, focused on international artists again. We show approximately 80 works in this gallery from the late 1960s through the present day. Um, this gallery really offers a space to explore craft from the last several decades in a slightly different but no less significant conversation, set of conversations, from the ones happening in the larger Lindy family wing. I can use this space to delve deeply into significant moments in craft practice over the last several decades, uh, into materials and technical ability, and the way that different generational relationships and educational institutions have impacted the field. And so, for one example, I have three works uh, by Glass artists working in the 20th century in different parts and uh, points of the field in this gallery, each of which speak to a mode of making that has developed in a place. So we have the United States represented by Harvey Littleton, really a center of hot glass, of blown glass. We have Brendan Scott French, who's working in Australia, which is where there's a real expertise in kiln cast glass. And then we have Stanislav Lubensky and Yaroslava Brishteva, who are working in the Czech Republic, where you really have a sense of mastery over um, a sort of large-scale cast glass. And so by having these works in comparison, we can start to have conversations in the space about, okay, so why is this the center of this kind of making here? What's different when we look at these kinds of methods with our audiences? Um, one installation in this space that's really deeply affecting uh, and nicely relevant to our setting today, because I know you just had Lauren's work on view at the museum not too long ago, um, is that which showcases photographs by uh, Lauren Kalman against a necklace by Eugene and Hiroko Pijanowski, who also have a Cranbrook connection. I'll just mention it whenever it comes up. <laughs> Working uh, in different ways, both come from a grounding of a really strong and intimate knowledge of metalsmithing, and both create works which have important things to say about beauty, the value of gold and materials in general, how jewelry might enhance or hinder the body, and what it means to adorn oneself. So on the right, the piece by the Pijanowskis, Oh, I Am Precious, number seven, this is a collaborative work by this husband and wife team, and it ignores presumptive boundaries between jewelry and sculpture, while also critiquing our understanding of value. Large, geometric, and golden, it seems both ostentatious and unfit for the human body. And so this is actually worn by um, folding the two sides together, and it becomes a quite large collar.
that goes around the neck, all made out of mizuhiki, which is a kind of Japanese paper cord. So we're not actually looking, we're getting the image of this kind of overwhelming gold. We don't have any of the value there. So some commentary in that. The gleaming color, right, suggests those kind of expensive materials. The work is made from this cheap and easily accessible one. In contrast, Lauren Coleman has created bodily embellishments from real gold. However, her works are worn to alter the body in a way that may seem unusual or off-putting. This is documented through photographs which focus on these alien elements in performance. Although the finished object is the image rather than the metalwork, Coleman's intimately connected with craft practice and asking some of the same questions about presentation, about value, about material um, proposed by her compatriots. Um, so this has been a really wonderful place to explore some of these ideas as we have these works cited against each other in the galleries. Um, actually, too fast. It's worth noting that I would happily show these works or any of the works I've mentioned in the Farrago Gallery um, in our contemporary space and vice versa. The ability for these works to transition from space to space, saying different things in each installation, is key to what the large and diverse platforms of the Encyclopedic Museum can offer to contemporary art and artists that's unique from institutions exclusively focused on the contemporary or that don't have a collection for context. Um, because we're interested in both historical and material contexts, but also in the intellectual, cultural, spatial, formal, technical, technological, and conceptual areas that craft can come around, we can really dream as many contexts as our collection will allow, which is a very exciting thing. And so one example of that um, is the way that we're able to put contemporary craft in our historical galleries. Here I'm showing uh, our new Korean collections gallery, which opened in 2012, and it features a contemporary work by the Korean um, artist Yi Suk Young, who takes um, leftover pieces of celadon and using a sort of kintsugi technique, puts them back together with gold into these sort of wonderful anthropomorphic forms. This was originally on view in the contemporary galleries and now has migrated here to a different context amongst historical celadons. Um, likewise, the MFA has a universally strong collection in historical decorative arts, strengths ranging from Egyptian artifacts to American furniture to European porcelain to ancient Greek and Roman vessels. So in collecting for the institution, I place a special focus on contemporary artists whose work adapts and interprets these historical moments, but isn't necessarily slavishly copying them, right? Who has a relationship really thinking about the, the root of the word contemporary, right, of our time, looking at what, is, uh, what was of the time of those pieces that made them important and thinking about of our time now and how they can have a dialogue across sort of history in the, the works that I bring into the conversation. So recent acquisitions that um, fit this boat include a fantastic neck piece, um, the Rokai neck piece by Jennifer Trask, from 2013 in which she is really using this remarkable um, sort of oversized necklace that I am, um, I, don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if the gallerist knows I'm using her photo to give you a sense of how it fits on the body, but she's very gracious to let me do that um, in absentia. <laughs> but really speaks to notions of portraiture, speaks to notions of framing and how jewelry can become a frame for the body in the same way that this language of the sort of gilded frame um, works in our sort of European paintings gallery. Um, we also have a remarkable frame collection and so there's a really lovely conversation that can be had there. Um, we also have a work um, by the artist Michael Eden that came into the collection and this is the first digitally fabricated object that's come into the MFA's holdings. Um, it came in just shortly after it was made in 2011. This is his blue bloom from his Wedge Wouldn't series. <laughs> Eden spent many, many, many years working as a sort of more traditional studio potter and wanted to think about um, ceramic technology and how technology changes and found himself thinking about Josiah Wedgwood, his role in sort of spearheading certain aspects of the Industrial Revolution, the idea of blue jasperware as a technological innovation and sort of wanted to connect the notion 
of 3D printing in 2011 to Wedgwood's own role as a technological innovator. So a really interesting and rich work that we have in the past shown with this fantastic Jasperware piece from the collection. At times, we don't have to look too far backwards or outside of our own history um, to make contemporary collect connections. In 2013, I commissioned Cranbrook alum Vivian Beer, um, who's now based in New Hampshire, to produce Anchored Candy Number no. 5. This is actually the first commission to enter the museum's Please Be Seated program in over 10 years. It had sort of laid dormant as no one was interested in it. And I really think it's an important thing to restart, so we're really excited about that. Um, and it's been wonderful to watch people engage with Vivian's work. In reviving commissions like these, we can address questions around function and touch that are key to craft, but are often, you know, by sheer necessity and practicality, largely absent from the museum experience. We allow visitors to physically engage with this work, to think about it, not just on an aesthetic level, um, but also we provide support and access to the artists that we engage with. So when I work on a commission like this, I bring Vivian in, I say, ask her what she's interested in, I give her access to the collection to see if there's anything that she wants to think about. This is actually the first time um, she's done a museum commission where the work's been able to be shown in natural light. And so she's worked with a dual pearlescent paint finish, so one that moves from color to color in space. And so in talking about sighting, she, we were able to give her an opportunity to do something she hadn't done before. Addressing contemporary issues around craft is a vital component of the museum's program of temporary exhibitions as well. So I'm showing here some installation shots of a 2013 exhibition I did called New Blue and White. The idea of crafts as an inclusive spectrum was key to this project, which included over 40 artists and designers across a variety of media and looked to the way that the history of the decorative arts can be used by contemporary artists as a platform. And here we're talking about blue and white ceramics from a variety of periods and locations, which provided myriad different emotional and conceptual reference points for the artists who were included. And I'll note that all of the artists I chose to work with were actually engaging with this topic before asked to participate in the exhibition. Um, they were whittled down from a list of about 450 people that I called together of contemporary folks engaging with this, not because a museum asked them to, but because they found it so powerful, which I think is really um, you know, meaningful. So through historical reference, artists were addressing many ideas that are sort of in the air about craft and making today. These were incorporated as sub-themes into the project. The upcycling of ready-made objects, speaking to larger ideas about ecological and political impulses in craft, as well as conversations about memory and the role of the hand, was explored by makers like Hasina Hackenberg, who is creating fantastic jewelry that uh, she uses a, um, a drill to take individual segments to create beads out of found plates. So you're seeing that on the right image, the actual the plate and then the necklace that has been removed from it. Um, we have folks like Robert Dawson, who's re, who, another, a British artist who's really thinking of um, how we can use digital printing on ceramic surfaces to give a sense of narrative. Um, this Dawson piece actually came into our collection from the show, and it's one of six pieces that have stayed with the MFA. So this is also a way that we work to collect and build um, what we have. Um, Annabeth Rosen uh, was really exploring abstraction and accumulative display in her work Wave, which has also come into the collection. This is a remarkable piece that's about, just to give you a sense of scale, this is about eight feet tall. So a mammoth work that, that speaks to notions of massing and accumulation, which is a, really a strategy to the, that I think we see many artists engage in craft fields thinking about, thinking through. Um, also a topic for Anne Agee in her work, Gross Domestic Product, thinking about domesticity and memory as well in that work. Poran Jinchi and Stephen Lee looked spe specifically at how identity, and here were um, Iranian-American 
in, uh, for Poran and Korean American for Steve can be an inherent part of an object when you're thinking about history, when you're thinking about the past. So these different kinds of layers allowed the exhibition to talk about many issues of craft and its diversity, but the, the focus as a, on historical reference allows us to have a visual and thematic unifier and connects contemporary impulses with the narrative and spatial context of the MFA. Conversely, craft material was the organizing principle for an exhibition that just closed this past January, developed in anticipation of the Ensika conference that took place in Providence in 2015. In collaboration with colleagues of mine in the Amer uh, American department, Nature, Sculpture, Abstraction, and Clay, 100 Years of America's American Ceramics was actually the MFA's first exhibition of American ceramics from its collection since 1984. So. <laughs> when you have lots of things to work with, lots of things can easily be ignored. It takes a, a human being to actually decide to shed some light, throw some attention. 75 ceramic objects were used to explore ideas of continuity in American artists' approach to ceramics over the past hundred years. So we really were thinking about the idea that often historical shifts in craft practice and aesthetics are positioned by both scholars and artists as complete breaks with the past. Through our holdings in one medium, we really hope to explore how certain broad types of experimentation and practice, um, things like an interest in the natural world, experimentation with glaze and texture, the use of the ceramic surface for drawing and design and an interest in sculptural form have been consistent areas of investigation even as they've manifested in different visual forms. So the most recent exhibition that I uh, had the opportunity to work with, Crafted Objects in Flux, also closed this past January. It sought to bring yet another conversation about craft and contemporary art making into the space of the Encyclopedic Museum. And I'm not gonna talk about her piece, but the cover object is this fantastic bracelet by Susie Gonch, which um, uh, for the jewelers, for the sculptors, um, a really interesting artist to spend some time with. This show introduced a selection of international and cross-generational artists working in a variety of contexts who all share a key goal to encourage us to question craft as being bound to a limited framework or definition in the context of art making and to see it in new and perhaps startling or contradictory ways. So the works on view in this exhibition were really intended to conspicuously straddle boundaries and to be deeply, deeply engaged and intertwined with mining the relevancy and meaning of craft. So lots of different conversations that can happen under that framework. Um, and so we featured 50 art, uh, works of art by 41 artists in this exhibition, international, cross-generational, working individually or collaboratively. Approximately a third of the exhibition was composed of works making their public debut and everything had been made in the past 10 years. So really contemporary for a big institution like ours. Um, the exhibition and its accompanying catalog was, and actually, I'll, forward here to just some, some install shots so you can get a sense of the sort of diversity and broad kinds of objects that were on display as a part of the show. Um, we organized the show into three themes, the performative object, the retooled objects, and the immersive object. And I'll give you some examples of how these were rendered in the gallery space as we, we continue through. So the performative object. How might an object be made through performance, perform in the world, or perform its own making? And we asked these kinds of questions to give people who didn't read any other text one thing to hold on to. That was a really significant and profound, we hoped, question about what it means to engage with craft. So we might imagine wheel throwing a ceramic vessel or blowing glass. This is sort of the physical theater, performative um, action of making an object. Likewise, the functional nature of many crafted works um, ties to a variety of human rituals and behaviors, and the crafted object becomes a tool used in the performance of everyday life. Objects can perform on pedestals by alluding to process or seemingly encouraging the viewer to handle, alter, and even participate with them. Again, something we can't facilitate in the museum, but it's an inherent part of, of making. 
Other objects might be used in or the result of actions and craft-based art practices aimed at building communities or creating new kinds of social constructions. And so um, the image that I'm showing here, and this is a spread from the catalog, um, shows Etsuko Ichikawa, who's among a growing number of contemporary artists using glass performatively rather than to make glass objects. She creates works called pyrographs. These are literally writing with fire, which capture the immediate and ephemeral impact of molten glass on paper and express fluid movement performed by both body and material in the making of work that's really calligraphic. And just to give you some process shots here, after studying painting, Ichikawa learned glassmaking at the Tokyo Glass Art Institute in her native Japan. She moved to the US in her early 30s to study at Pilchuck, the renowned glass school founded by Dale Chihuly, where she spent seven years. An intensive training in glassmaking is essential for her, as her practice depends on a deep understanding of and commitment to the many aspects of glass, its physical properties, the complex technical processes that are used to handle it, and the specialized equipment and production spaces needed to facilitate working with a material whose temperature often exceeds 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit in order to be pliable enough to do what she's doing with it. And she's developed all this knowledge, which I think was a, a really interesting um, kind of concept for our visitors who are not a part of this world to grasp. She developed all of this knowledge not in order to make glass objects, but in order to make drawings. The strength of her performance-based work is that it results in a tangible thing that's at once evidence of past artistic action and artistic outcome and doesn't tie her learned skill to an object that shows that necessarily. Her practice, like that of many other glass blowers, is highly dependent on bodily action that can be very dance-like and she ends up teaching workshops to dancers based on the movement she engages in her work. Um, and sometimes she even takes it into a really highly performative capacity. I'm showing here an image of a performance at the Tacoma Art Museum um, in 2010, where she has actually choreographed working with six dancers from a, a ballet company in Seattle, choreographed the making of a work in the hot shop to Stravinsky's Firebird. So each pull from the furnace is sort of timed with a note in the music. Back to Cranbrook. <laughs> um, approaching the performative from another angle, Sonia Clark's work looks at craft practice and community engagement in the public sphere as essentially performative. Um, for her, hairdressing is the primordial fiber art. And in this work, the Haircraft Project, which is now part of the MFA's collection, um, Clark visited with 11 hairdressers over a period of a year and invited them to demonstrate their ample skills of twisting, braiding, and beading on two different substrates. Clark's own head, which is what we're seeing on the left, and a canvas primed with threads to echo strands of hair. And so what you're seeing on the bottom right is actually that canvas before any work has been done to it, just with the hanging threads of silk. The Haircraft Project, and I'm showing the piece as it was shown in the galleries, facilitated the creation and display of crafted objects that explicitly engage social practice, performance, and process. Each hairdresser was able to showcase the extent of her talents in both a permanent and an ephemeral way. And Clark's head, for the year that she engaged with this process, she wore each style for about a month, served as an ever-living, ever-changing gallery space. Each stylist's work was documented through photographs of the back of the artist's head, and you can see that the stylist is actually looking out, connected with this work. The stylist herself provides a sort of human connection and sense of authorship to a craft that tends to remain anonymous once it transitions out of the salon and into the street. She confuses here these boundaries between the hand skills that lead to an object, or fiber art, and hand skills that lead to something ephemeral, hair work, asking us to envision the two practices as equal participants in a creative arena whose value system is influenced by pre-existing social and cultural understandings. So the hair crafts depicted in the photographs and canvases that resulted from these interactions with Richmond's hairdressing community, once they entered into the gallery context, were reframed no longer as bodily adornment, but as art object. 
And so intermingling these two modes of judgment, these two communities, um, and conventions of presentation is also part of performative action for Clark. So departing from typical gallery practice, when the piece was first shown in Richmond, um, each stylist's work was judged publicly by a jury, as might occur at a hair show, um, except there was a People's Choice Award, and then there was um, a selection judged by experts, including the um, curator at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York, Lowry Sims, who I'm showing in the center there, and on the right, Alalia Bundles, who is the um, a descendant of Madam C.J. Walker. I'm showing Sonia Clark's work of Madam C.J. Walker in Combs, um, the first African-American self-made female millionaire made, making her work developing hair products for the African-American community. So lots of interesting layers happening here. With this in mind, knowing that we were going to bring this work to Boston, I invited Sonia to produce her first performance in a museum space this past October. And so we, we put on a performance, about a six hour long durational performance titled Hairdressers Are My Heroes. Um, Sonia came and she looked at works in our collection um, and she chose this piece, uh, a helmet mask from Sierra Leone, which is actually a depiction of a hairstyle, not a sort of abstracted helmet that you might think it is. This is a, a sort of artist's rendering of um, a hairstyle that's used in a sort of initiation, a set of initiation rituals from girlhood to womanhood. And so for six hours in our galleries, Sonia and I worked to find a hairdresser, a local hairdresser here. Um, we've got Kathy Montreville from Malden, Massachusetts, who runs a great salon called Hair, uh, Hair therapy, if any of you are in the market for a new do when you're in Boston next. Um, and Sonia actually had Kathy do her hair after the work in our collection, which as you can see in the image on the right, is in the same gallery, in the same proximity, while onlookers watched. And so taking this really private action of the salon, bringing it into the museum space, connecting it to our collections, and we had, over the course of six hours, we had about 800 people through who sat in dialogue with Sonia. We videotaped the whole thing, so we have a really um, interesting record of it. And at the end, this was the work that Kathy produced that Sonia took home and no longer exists other than in photographs. The use of materials in an unusual or unconventional set of ways moves us to the second theme of the exhibition, the retooled object. So the question here is how do new modes of fabrication, whether digital or analog, expand artistic possibilities? Um, we have a sort of conventional definition of craft that emphasizes artistic mastery of complicated and transformative material practices, typically tied to work done by hand. Yet, as much as craft is centered in the hand, it's also centered in the tool. The long history of innovation and in craft shows artists continually expanding the physical and conceptual possibilities of a given material through the tools they use and how they use them. We would never call a, a vessel that's thrown on a wheel not handmade, and yet a kick wheel is really different than an electric wheel, and you have innovation there. So, Acknowledging the role that tools give us in how we engage with craft practice, I think, is a really important way. And thinking of retooling rather than the, sub, sub, uh, the sort of sublimation of craft to technology is a useful way to deal with that kind of change. And so we wanted to talk a little bit about that. So Cranbrook again. <laughs> the artist Stanley Lexon has been expertly practicing the art of retooling for several decades. His first retooling is um, taking the sort of traditional, not traditional, but uh, a sort of making uh, process electroforming with a history and then bringing it into the context of contemporary jewelry in the 1960s and 70s. Um, in the exhibition, we showed work produced by Lexon and his wife, Daniela Kerner, who have used, used computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing to produce artist jewelry for some time. Um, Lexon started working at Tyler School of Art in 1962, shortly after he left Cranbrook, and in 1989, designed the first uni university-level CAD CAM course for artists, uh, jeweler, uh, excuse me, artists working in jewelry. So, this is something he's been in deeply engaged with for, for the past few decades. 
According to Lexan, and I'm quoting him here, if we wish to speak to and about our time, is there a better medium to use than the technology developed by this highly industrialized society? So we have a digitally fabricated um, brooch here that's actually two parts intended for uh, the cloth to go through the two elements and then they're clasped together by rare earth magnets. The South African-born artist Jonathan Keep has been making traditional studio ceramics since the late 1970s, and over the past um, 10 years, he's come to think of 3D printing as a fourth way of making for ceramic artists, the first three being hand building, throwing, and molding. And it allows the artist, he's looking to generate forms not typically visualized or created by other ceramic techniques. Um, he notes, and I'm quoting the artist here, I consider myself a traditionalist, but always make the point that tradition is a continuum, and what I am doing with digital tools is just a continuation of pottery. He builds forms in virtual space using Java coding, which he taught himself. He manipulates them using the open source software program Blender and prints porcelain objects. You're seeing one of those on the right here. Using a 3D printer, he's adapted to print in clay, explaining the process as sort of computerized coil building that works layer by layer. And usually when I mention this in a talk, I, I know that I won't have any takers, but I think I might here. This is available to every single one of you as he has placed instructions, how-to videos, and a huge bounty of information about the process online. So please let me know if somebody follows these YouTube videos and builds their own digital uh, ceramic printer. I would love to see that. The four related but disparate vessels that we had in the exhibition that comprise his sound surface, Benjamin Britten 4C interludes from Peter Grimes, are guided by the tone and the rhythm each of one interlude from the English composer's 1945 opera. Each vessel grows from the same point in virtual space and subsequent points that connect to the tone, the notes, the length of the notes, um, the way that they exist in sort of space on the recording, they map out a vessel-shaped framework onto which a three-dimensional computerized mesh is applied to create a surface. So each work is actually um, the height that it is based on the length of the interlude that it corresponds to. So this is a, 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 a sort of situation where Keep is thinking, I can't visualize music in clay using any other mode of making than I, you know, and, but if I have digital printing, if I have the software program, I can do something differently that I'm unable to do in any other way. Um, and it really speaks to sort of what happens when you take the fundamentally transitory nature of music in which notes simultaneously appear and disappear as they're played, it's never there, and try to create that in a static object. An interesting proposition. Um, it was important to me in this exhibition that the section not only include digital fabrication, but also speak to analog endeavors at developing new craft-making methodologies. And so I'm showing here a tool by the Swedish Chilean furniture maker Anton Alvarez. He created his thread map wrapping machine to build objects without screws, nails, or joinery, instead relying on thousands of yards of thread coated in glue, which is sometimes pigmented. The device is controlled by a foot pedal whose operators can add chair legs or seat backs as the piece in process spins. And so I'm showing here some images of how furniture objects using the thread wrapping machine are made. And so you have folks on other, either side, the piece spins and it wraps the thread around the object, sort of binding them, and there is either glue or colored pigment that can be placed into the machine that comes out as the thread comes out. The ritualistic and repetitive action of thread wrapping, already part of numerous types of textile techniques, becomes both sort of analog and mechanized in Alvarez's hands. Um, and the sort of tool here, the thread wrapping machine, is really equal parts sewing machine and spinning wheel. Ornamentation, rather than being applied onto a surface, is built into the construction process, um, even as decorative patterns are created by the various colors of thread and glue wrapping around each other. With that in mind, Alvarez specifically locates the generation of the system and his desire to create this system in an understanding and study of traditional woodworking, noting that his machine focuses on joinery, on how elements come together, because, and I'm quoting the artist here, 
Woodworkers tend to celebrate joints and to care how elements come together. So that's the point of focus here. And I will say that Alvarez comes from, he trained with um, traditional cabinet makers in Sweden. So for the last uh, set of themes that we considered, we talked about the immersive object. How can shifting a physical encounter in the gallery change our perception and understanding of the crafted object? I'm thinking here about the fact that we spend our lives in made environments. Crafted objects populate our homes, while craft intensive modes of making, so we might think about bricklaying or tile work, for example, build the structures in which we live, eat, work, and play. Shifts of scale can amplify or alter inherent qualities and sort of cultural meanings of materials like clay, wood, fiber, metal, and glass. And sighting objects in unconventional parts of the built environment really work to adjust or overturn our expectations. And so um, we showed a number of objects that really asked us to reconsider our bodies in relationship to craft, how we might become immersed literally or figuratively in an object. So we did a commission with the ceramist Nathan Craven, who created a site-specific and temporary work for the MFA titled Poros. He uses ceramics as a building material to draw on sort of assumed distinctions between sculpture, object, and architecture. And I'm showing on the right the artist um, completing the piece in our space. His installations are dependent largely on architectural form for their uh, architectural space for their form. They're composed using thousands. In this case, we used about 6,500 individual hollow ceramic elements, each only inches in size. Um, they don't have the sort of geometric regularity that we come to expect of commercial building materials, which must be standardized and efficient. Instead, they take on abstract forms that reference a variety of themes. These individual bricks are made using recycled clay pushed through an extruder and then shaped into logs with forms set by hand carved dies. They're dried and cut with a tile saw before firing and they emerge as individual elements that can be um, amassed into a myriad uh, of types of different permutations. And I will say that when this work came out, all of these pieces um, went back into circulation and moved into other works totally modular, they can be reglazed, refired, incredibly sturdy. Um, at the MFA, Craven directly engaged the architecture of the West Wing. Um, he worked in a space, this is about a nine foot square window that got really remarkable light. It was actually praised by um, Ada Louise Huxtable in her 1981 review of, of the wing as um, where she said a return to natural light to museums after years of darkness should be a cause for universal rejoicing, which it is for everyone except curators and conservators because <laughs> it's highly damaging to the artworks that we show. And so finding a way to really engage with the architecture of our space um, with a work that could, could sustain um, uh, in that space was really exciting. His hollow forms cited in relationships to, to these windows um, take beams of light. They shine through, they illuminate this network of vitrified elements, drawing our attention to the window, not only as a portal for looking out, but for its ability to define connections between interior and exterior spaces. This is something that is not really an object and it's not really architecture, but it is both at the same time. We showed work by the artist Allison Elizabeth Taylor, who relies on architectural language associated with the adornment of the interior rather than structure for her works, combining intricate marquetry, so small pieces of wood cut and assembled, along with painting and staining, a work like Tap Left On, which I'm showing sort of a, as much of a close-up as I can give you on the left, and how it was cited in the gallery on the upper right, references water damage caused by a frustrated ex-homeowner who flooded his foreclosed home in an act of contempt for sort of greater economic powers. And so instead of using marquetry in the way that um, Taylor first encountered it, which is in the studiolo from the Ducal Palace at Gubbio in the Metz collection, well worth a visit if you have never been, where we're using um, marquetry to sort of render, create, paint pictures in wood, give a sense of illusionistic space, in this piece, we're actually seeing the walls rotting away. We're seeing the beams that we're not supposed to see. We're seeing the wires that have come loose. So a highly political piece, um, works that also really deal interestingly with the context of memory. This piece was also in the show, Armstrong Congolium One, 
which anyone who has ever refinished floors in an old house should be familiar with. Also, Armstrong Congolium is the name of a flooring manufacturer, and we're looking at layers and layers and layers, like the sort of rings on a tree or different strata that tell a story across time. Here, this is actually just one layer of really beautifully done marquetry. And the last work, I'll end on a Cranbrook work, <laughs> um, is a, a commission that we did with the fiber artist Roland Ricketts, who creates architectural scale installations that provide an encounter with both process and product in the same space. Um, much of this approach really stems from his unusually intimate and comprehensive involvement with making of works from start to finish, including growing the material used to create his dyes. He studied traditional indigo dyeing in Japan, has been working with that uh, a sort of practice for two decades now. On his current farm in Bloomington, Indiana, leaves are harvested, dried, and composted, then fermented in wood ash lye in order to make the plant soluble and dyeing possible. I'm showing here Roland harvesting those plants and then a new vat on the first day of dyeing. Um, this time spent in the farming process is very much a part of the finished product, as you'll see in these installation shots of the piece that was done for the MFA. Um, it's actually currently in a show called Mood Indigo about indigo dyeing across time at the Seattle Art Museum, which we're really excited about. So anyone heading to the West Coast, you can take a look at it. Um, Ricketts here incorporates elements of the process. So we're not just looking at um, indigo dyed cloth that's really been dyed in this gradient pattern to give a sense of time, right? Dye in the dye bath for longer has a deeper saturation and so we necessarily think about time when we're looking at a sort of gradient. But the back wall of the gallery, which was about 14 feet high, is covered with dried indigo plants. So there's a real sensory experience. You can smell this installation, which smells very sweet. And for those of you who might know the smell, faintly of tobacco plants, um, but well before you immerse yourself in the space, which once you're inside really does feel like you're sort of inside a vat of indigo. Um, He's asking you to see multiple realities of indigo dyeing, sort of cycles of growth and material manipulation, and an evolving tradition of craft knowledge by inhabiting a space that collapses process and product. He also, I will say, um, I think it's really interesting here, works in collaboration with the sound artist Norbert Herber, um, who's recorded sounds as varied as that of the Hane. So we're seeing that on the left here. This is the tool that's used to rotate the compost pile. So you get that sound of the dye changing. He's also developed a program that actually takes the individual saturations of the dyed cloth and connects them each to a tone. So the sound is constantly evolving based on where you are in the space, whether you're in a space that has a greater saturation or less saturation. So this no notion of a process ever evolving, even as it's deeply steeped in history, is very much a part of Roland's practice. So contemporary works which speak to the rich potentiality of craft really do exist across a number of contexts in the Encyclopedic Museum. We acknowledge here that craft exists both as a subject for art making and a tool from a larger kit, a set of assumptions to adhere to or to deconstruct, or even a history one might position oneself against. As the MFA builds its contemporary craft holdings, we're really finding our direction in bringing interdisciplinarity, subjectivity, and ambiguity where we can into a sort of oft rigid museum space. It's a sort of productive tension that comes there. While this continues to impact what and how we collect, the ability to shift a narrative or offer multiple narratives to our visitors not only serves to more deeply root each object that we collect in a variety of contexts that we're choosing to show it in, but also makes it more accessible outside of context. As we research one context, we learn more, we build information about these objects that we've committed to care for. By taking an interest through the lens of craft in a wide array of objects, ranging from traditional to experimental, we really are looking to productively broaden conversations about craft materiality and art making today. Thank you guys so much.